pure experiences. Welcome to the Pure Experiences Podcast. We are going to continue the book Pointers by Nisardat Maharaj, written by Ramesh Balsekar. Chapter 4 Manifest and the Unmanifest of One Is I, an ever present entity? Appearing at different levels, manifest and unmanifest, this question is often posed before Maharaj in various ways. In different words, by different persons, the essence of the question being the same, sometimes the bolder visitor might bring up the question right at the start of a session. If Maharaj should happen to mention, which he often does, that his listeners must always bear in mind that he is talking not as an individual to another individual, but as a consciousness to consciousness about the nature of consciousness. According to Maharaj, at the level of the mind, the I may be considered under three aspects. Number one, the impersonal or avyakt or the unmanifest, the absolute I, beyond all sensory perception or experience and unaware of itself. Number two, the superpersonal or the vyakt manifested, which is the reflection of the absolute in consciousness as I am. And number three, the personal vyakti, which is a construct of the physical and vital processes, the psychosomatic apparatus in which consciousness manifests itself. Maharaj, however, makes it a point to repeat at frequent intervals that such distinction is purely a notional one and cannot exist in reality. Essentially, there is no difference between the manifest, vyakt, and the unmanifest, avyakt, just as there is no difference essentially between light and daylight. The universe is full of light, but that light cannot be seen until it is reflected against a surface as daylight. And what the daylight reveals is the individual person, that is the vyakti. The individual in the form of the human body is always the object. Consciousness as the witnessing is the subject and their relation of mutual dependence. Consciousness cannot appear without the apparatus of a body and the body cannot have sentience without consciousness is the proof of their basic identity with the Absolute. They both are the same consciousness, one at rest, the other in movement, each conscious of the other. The entire manifested universe, explains Maharaj, exists only in consciousness. The conceptualized process would be as follows. Consciousness arises in pure being, for no particular cause or reason other than that it is its nature to do so, like waves on the surface of the sea. In consciousness, the world appears and disappears, and each one of us is entitled to say, all there is, is I, all there is, is mine, before all beginnings, after all endings. I am there to witness whatever happens. Me, you, and he are only appearances. In the consciousness, all are basically I. It is not that the world does not exist as an appearance in consciousness. The world is the totality of the known in the potential of the unknown. The world can be said to appear but not be. Duration of the appearances, of course, will differ according to the different scales of time, apart from the fact that the world disappears in deep sleep and reappears in the waking state, the duration of its appearance would vary according to the allotted span of one's lifetime. A few hours for an insect and eons for the trinity of Brahma, Vishnu and Maheshwar. Ultimately, however, whatever is an appearance in consciousness must end and it cannot have any reality. The manner in which Maharaj expounds this sublime knowledge is truly astonishing in its range of aspects. 
while the central theme continues to remain firmly anchored. He says that awareness comes from the absolute or avyakta and pervades the inner self or vyakta. The outer self, vyakti, is that part of one's being of which one is not aware, inasmuch as although one may be conscious for every sentient being has consciousness, it is possible for one not to be aware. In other words, the outer self or vyakti is delineated by the physical body, the inner self vyakta by consciousness and it is only in pure awareness that the supreme or avyakta can be contacted. There can never be any experience as such of the absolute for the simple reason that there cannot be possibly be anything objective about the absolute which is essentially pure subjectivity. It is the inner self-consciousness which is the experiencing medium for all experience. The absolute provides the potentiality for the experience. The self provides the actuality. The individual person's contact with the awareness of the absolute can come about only when the mind is fasting, as it were, because then the process of conceptualizing ceases. When the mind is quiet, it reflects reality. When the mind is absolutely motionless, it dissolves and only reality remains. And that is why, says Maharaj again and again, it is necessary to be one with consciousness. When the mind feasts, reality disappears. When the mind fasts, reality enters. Awareness, Maharaj points out in yet another way, when it is in contact with an object, a physical form becomes witnessing. When at the same time there is self-identification with the object, such a state becomes the person. In reality, there is only one state. When corrupted and tainted by self-identification, it may be called person, that is the Vyakti. When it is tinted by a sense of being, the resulting consciousness becomes the witnessing. When it remains in its pristine purity, untainted and untinted, it is the supreme, the absolute. It is necessary to be clear about the difference, notional though it be, between awareness of the Absolute and the consciousness in which the universe appears. Maharaj repeatedly warns us, one is only the reflection of the other, but reflection of the sun in the, dew, in the dew drop is not the sun. In the absence of objectivization, as in deep sleep, the apparent universe is not but we are, there. this is so because what we are is what the apparent universe is and vice versa. Dual in presence, non-dual in absence. Irreconcilably separate in concept, inviably united when unconceived. So this was the chapter number four, manifest and the unmanifest are one. Here, Balsekar has taken up the important topic of the relative I. What should I call as the I? Should I call this body as I? Should I call this mind as I? Should I call the consciousness as I? Or should I call the supreme, the absolute awareness as I? And Maharaj is breaking it down in three aspects. That is the impersonal I which is the unmanifested one and the superpersonal that is the manifested one which is also called the consciousness or the I am and the personal, the individual one which is physical in nature which appears as an object. So as you are probably aware by now that this concept of I is a creation and depending on the ignorance of the person Depending on the ignorance of that mind which is holding the idea of I, it keeps shifting. It will shift not only to these three levels, it also goes beyond the body and identifies with relatives for example. My father, my mother, my child and so on. 
and it will identify with and the non living things also my house my car my table my chair my country and my society and my caste and my religion these are all extensions of the i the identification just like i say my hand and my feet and my nose same thing so maharaj is making this clear that these are only ideas these may have a practical utility for the organism but that which is taking all these forms and appears as various concepts and ideas is one so that which is manifested is equal to that which is potential that which is unmanifested so to to demonstrate that he gives a very beautiful metaphor that of the light light is everywhere but it needs an object for us to know that there is light without the object it's all black darkness the light is unmanifested it is very amazing to see that we call the light as physical but nobody can see it it, it is not registered at all unless it is reflected by something so the, uh, you can say that the avyakta or the unmanifest is like light cannot be seen it's always there and uh, the manifested or the vyakta is like holding an object in the light so now there is a two way relation there is light which is reflecting from that object and entering another object which is the eye the sense organ i e y e and uh, now there is a mutual connection which is called the consciousness the word consciousness has the word con in it which means to see together it takes two to for there to be consciousness the object and subject they always appear together the experience and the experiencer they always appear together it's not possible for one to be there without the other this is the manifested and the third aspect is when you forget that which is perceiving which is which knows the object that is being reflected in the light and entertains the object only that is the vyakti or the person so this is a metaphor which should which should make it very very clear what is happening it should give you indirect knowing of that which these words are pointing at so at one place he says that there can never be any experience as such of the absolute why can't there be an experience of the absolute this is like a play of the language if you see the experience is always of the absolute you see whatever i am experiencing right now whatever this experience is experiencing right now is the absolute what he means to say is that you cannot isolate the absolute as an object place it here in front of you and say that look i am seeing the absolute no the absolute awareness appears as manifested consciousness as reflected consciousness it happens only when there is a body with sense organs and nervous system otherwise it remains unexpressed and manifested in a potential form so he says it's not possible to have an experience of the absolute for the simple reason that there cannot possibly be anything objective about the absolute which is essentially pure subjectivity so what is pure subjectivity usually we think that um, these thoughts that are going on in my mind these um, imaginations and desires and uh, feelings and emotions that are flooding the interior of my mind that is subjective but no there is an experiencer which is looking at these mental activities also so whatever goes on in the mind is also objective and to distinguish it from subjective i always call the mental activities as non physical so physical is that which is perceived through senses senses are giving me the perception which i call as physical objects and the mind is giving me perceptions or the non physical these are all objects only the subject is that which is witnessing 
and the pure subject is that which is not even witnessing which simply is so the pure subject cannot be known because it is not witnessing anything that is the absolute so it cannot be known as an experience but it is always there for example in deep sleep there is there are no objects in our current definition of objects no mind no world nothing no objects but the subject also disappears but the pure subjectivity is there the absolute awareness is there because if not then what wakes up what starts is the activity of the mind and what appears as the world so the unmanifest is always there it never goes away there is no other place for it to go away <laughs> there is nothing else there for it to come back to it remains like a screen which remains invisible while the movie is playing the turn of the movie it's all darkness for this reason the ignorant person thinks that there is only movie there is no screen so this should make it clear the difference between the absolute awareness or which can also be called as unmanifested reality existence or the nirgun brahma and the manifested one which appears in the form of duality the object and subject this is the consciousness and the person which is an object but because of the ignorance in the mind is taken as subject so he makes it very very clear here that when awareness is in contact with an object a physical form it becomes witnessing when at the same time there is self identification with the object such as the object called body it becomes the person but in reality there is only one state which is the supreme the absolute awareness so from where does the world come from and obviously since there is only one the absolute the awareness the world comes from there and uh, maharaj says that it is not that the world does not exist as an appearance in the consciousness the world is the totality of the known in the potential of the unknown the world can be said to appear but not be what does this mean this means that world is an appearance it appears to be there and it is only that which is being known right now right here there is a potential for more to know there is an infinite potential for the world to appear in different forms that which is not currently in our experience we call it as unknown that which we are experiencing is the known so whatever is known becomes the world including the contents of the memory that was known in the past and there is a almost unlimited potential in which it can appear out of the unknown so the world keeps appearing like this but it cannot be said to exist it is not actually there so why do we say that it's not there because it's gone as soon as it is witnessed it has changed as soon as it is experienced so it is a pure change there is only change the potential changes are becoming the actual changes they are registered in the memory they are registered its perceptions and whatever mental contents if you stop actualizing it the changes the potential changes then actually there is nothing these changes these meaningful changes is what is called as information the bits and bytes they are not objects they do not have an existence it is only when something changes it contains some amount, some amount of information so the change is an apparent change it appears an actual change only because of the memory what is memory memory is nothing but a technical term for the mind mind and its processes are memory our mind is nothing but memory in motion because memory cannot be static it's always in motion so just like when we drop a pebble in a quiet pond the waves arise and they travel across the pond and if they don't die out then they will be there forever so 
dropping of the stone is causing a change and the water surface of the water is storing that change that is memory is there anything no so therefore the world is called as an, as an appearance including the body and the mind these are all appearances and depending on the lifetime of this apparatus which registers these appearances and the world can look like as if it is permanent or it comes and goes very quickly like for an insect it is few hours or one day two day but for a whale or for somebody who, a disembodied mind it can be hundreds of years thousands of years so how do we know these things how do we know that there is consciousness how do we know there is absolute awareness and he gives a very simple method which is well known to all the spiritual practitioners and that is quieting the mind so he says the individual person's contact with the awareness of the absolute can come about only when the mind is fasting as it were because then the process of conceptualizing ceases when the mind is quiet it reflects reality when the mind is absolutely motionless it dissolves and only reality remains so you know what is mind that is need not be told all the perceptions including the world and whatever goes on in the so called mind field is the mind the play of the memory when this stops what remains is absolute reality only when the perception stops when the thinking mental activity stops the reality is seen it is not that the reality appears from somewhere no the only the play that is happening on the on this you can say screen space like screen of the reality the absolute that play stops and for for a time being it shines so he says when the mind feasts reality disappears when the mind fasts reality enters so it is like again in the movie metaphor we forget that there is a screen because to we are engrossed in the images that are appearing there and if you take a two or three year old child the child has no concept of screen at all the child can see only the images and in the tiny mind of the child they are real never thinks about the screen he sees only the pretty animals and the figures and uh, butterflies and whatever is there in the children's movie <laughs> he never ever thinks about the screen and you can say and a typical ignorant person is like this whatever appears is taken as reality so that includes all the illiterate people that includes all the educated people that includes all these engineers doctors scientists and religious figures each and everyone is like a tiny 2 year old child taking the cartoon on the screen to be reality so all you need to do is look through the mind because it's kind of very difficult to stop the show of the mind you can use some tricks like breathing exercises or whatever there are thousands of ways but you can right now right here look through the mind look through these pictures that it is projecting what do you see is the absolute it is not going to appear as a screen or space or a light or whatever these people think you see an ordinary person has very ordinary kind of delusions <laughs> but a spiritual seeker has spiritual kind of delusions they sit there with the eyes closed and they wait for the absolute to appear before their eyes and now you can see that it is kind of spiritual stupidity the absolute cannot appear it because it never disappeared because it never went away where will it go are there two kinds of realities one here which you are experiencing and the one which will appear when you stop experiencing that no there is only one reality like bodhi dharma says this mind is the zen mind this mind is the buddha mind where from where else are you going to bring the absolute reality it is shining right now right here just ignore that which is appearing it is here it is pure subjectivity it's not going to appear as an object 
it is not going to appear as an experience right now right here it is there oneness is here this experience is the experience of oneness this experience your current experience the ordinary experience the open eyes drinking eating dancing talking this is oneness this is absolute reality look beyond the appearances ignore the appearances so this can happen in two steps first you can say that all that appears is not me which is very basic it should happen on the first day for any spiritual seeker any guru worth his salt should tell you that this this should be the first thing that he should tell you that appearances are not you and then the consciousness appears kind of as a separation from all the appearances and the next step is to see that the appearances are nothing but the absolute only it is like the waves on the pond is nothing it's the water only the waves do not exist apart from the pond to look at the pond all you need to do is ignore the waves and the pond is always there so the people and many teachers they do this kind of mistake that they want to experience the absolute no you cannot it is the one that is the experience and the experience are the consciousness is the absolute you cannot have a consciousness without the absolute he says it is a reflection of the absolute like dew drops reflect one sun and that uh, metaphor takes care of the universality of consciousness what i think is this is my personal consciousness my property just like i own a house i own a car i own a wife and i own children i own this body i own a degree and i own a profession same way i own a consciousness now this is again ignorance very deep ignorance because if that is the case then every everybody owns a personal consciousness has anybody seen that kind of consciousness is there a way to know that this is the case so it's a big delusion and this metaphor of sun shining on dew drops makes it clear that it appears as a reflected consciousness the absolute appears as reflected consciousness in the dew drops so dew drops here are the bodies the body mind systems and the reflection is consciousness that appears in them as an every dew drop is going to say that oh i can see it what they are seeing is the one sun one dew drop does not know what is reflecting in the other dew drop so this is kind of um, what you call a very very clever arrangement by the maya to keep us separated is very clever i must admit there is no way to come out of this illusion if nobody tells you there is no way intelligence does not go there it is beyond intellect as maharaj has said the mind does not go there it is not possible to know it without with mind no mind is the absolute awareness mind is not the absence of absolute awareness it is a covering up of it so this clever arrangement of the maya or the maya is nothing but the mind only it is only a thought in the mind that i am separate my consciousness is all separate and there is no such thing as absolute so if you recall the the book that we read advait bodh dipika it uh, defines the maya as a projection superposition and uh, secondly it gives rise to this thought that it does not shine forth so this projection or the or the superficial appearances are, are taken as reality and the mind simply assumes it um, brain washes you into thinking no absolute cannot be here i cannot see it it does not come forth any time at all so maharaj here is saying that uh, don't worry about these things there is only one absolute these things they appear only and in this objects the objects that are you seeing day to day they are also absolute absolute they are also unmanifested this consciousness that you think is personal or the reflected awareness is also absolute 
there's nothing special about it not different from absolute and the space like without any qualities the pure subjectivity the satchitanand the being awareness bliss is the absolute is always there is always there so the last but one paragraph says that awareness maharaj points out in yet another way when it is in contact with an object a physical form becomes witnessing when at the same time there is self identification with the object such a state becomes the person in reality there is only one state when corrupted and tainted by self identification it may be called a person when it is tainted by a sense of being the, res- the resulting consciousness becomes the witnessing when it remains in pristine purity untainted and untinted it is the supreme the absolute so only the forms taken by the absolute that's all the tricky thing here is that the absolute cannot be known in form of consciousness or as an object it is not the object not the subject and it is the subject and it is the object this is the trick then the mind cannot come out of it so just look at your ordinary experience look at your ordinary consciousness it is only the absolute that appears in these forms otherwise there is no way for the absolute to make itself known to itself this is the process through which it happens so let's proceed to the chapter number 5 which is awareness and consciousness the outstanding feature about maharaj's talks with the visitors is the pervading sense of their total spontaneity subjects are never selected earlier but maharaj's utterances have a unique resilience which gives them an exhilarating freshness every time and when marvels all the more when when recalls that he has been talking like this without any previous preparation two sessions a day every day in the week including sundays for last many years and then on top of this maharaj says with a chuckle of amusement what do i talk about only one subject the same subject you and i the world outside and god generally maharaj does not bother to wait for his audience before opening any topic that comes up in his mind sometimes his small loft room gets filled to capacity within 15 minutes or so at other times when he starts talking one might say thinking aloud there are hardly 3 or 4 persons present but it makes no difference to him he may talk even to a single seeker if he so chooses and expound to him with just the basics of his teaching relating them to each other and placing them in true perspective his mind is whole mind that goes beyond pragmatism his thinking is total thinking one morning when i had paid my respects to maharaj and sat down i found that there were only two other persons present maharaj suddenly said what is the difference between awareness and consciousness if any when something like this happens one does not really know whether he expects an answer or whether he is merely thinking aloud when hesitates to answer for fear of breaking the flow of his thoughts but then he might also say why don't you answer have you been wasting my time listening to the talks all day this morning however he carried on without waiting for an answer he observed that awareness is of the absolute and therefore beyond the three gunas whereas consciousness is something fed by and limited by in the food body when the food body is destroyed consciousness also disappears mind you no one dies the body made of the five elements mingles with the elements when it is lifeless and consciousness which is subject to the three gunas becomes free of the gunas awareness is the primordial original state prior to the concept of space time needing no cause no support it simply is however the moment the concept of consciousness arises on this original state of unicity in the sense i am arises causing a condition of duality consciousness is with a form a reflection of awareness against the surface of matter one cannot think of consciousness apart from awareness 
there cannot be a reflection of the sun without the sun but there can be awareness without consciousness in deep sleep for instance there is no consciousness it is resting but awareness is certainly there because on waking one is aware of having slept but only on waking maharaj never allows us to forget that it is consciousness alone which is our constant companion and that it is the continuous attention to one's stream of consciousness that takes one on to awareness the basic existence that which is life love joy according to maharaj the very consciousness of being conscious is already a movement towards awareness the mind by its very nature is outgoing always tending to seek the source of things within the things themselves when it is directed towards the source within it is almost like the beginning of a new life awareness replaces consciousness the i am which is a thought in consciousness ceases in awareness there is no thought awareness is a source of consciousness maharaj suggests that it is an excellent spiritual exercise to sit quietly and watch what comes to the surface of the mind what we call thoughts are like ripples on the surface of water thoughts always lead to identification or condemnation they are products of preconceived notions and stand in the way of real understanding just as water is serene when free of ripples so is the mind serene when free of thoughts when it is passive and fully receptive in the mirror of your mind says maharaj all kinds of pictures will appear stay for a while and disappear silently watch them come and go be alert but not attracted or repelled it is important not to be involved this attitude of silent witnessing will have the effect gradually of driving away all useless thoughts like unwanted guests that are ignored by being this within yourself that is in the i amness by watching the flow of mind without interfering or judging as a dispassionate witness the deep unknown will be encouraged to come to the surface of consciousness and release its unused energies to enable you to understand the mystery of the origin of life so here probably there is nothing to comment on it is crystal clear but uh, maharaj is giving you a um, very simple meditation to make the awareness appear this is the ignorance in the mind of a seeker that i need to bring on the awareness from somewhere this consciousness of the mind body and objects the world is not good enough there is not awareness there so he gives you a, a little meditation a sit down and watch do nothing if you try to do something it will be an activity of some kind and then the watching will be interrupted so be alert but let there be no movement of the mind towards or away from whatever is appearing and then like magic the, <laughs> the awareness appears but it appears as if it was never absent so nothing really appears and the thoughts disappear that's all happens so instead of knowing what awareness is you can be the awareness so meditation is not witnessing awareness it is being awareness so when there is absolutely nothing to reflect in the mind the consciousness is the awareness this is what is he saying he is calling as i am this so this has a good effect on the mind first effect is that it becomes very calm and quiet peaceful and the useless mechanical activity will stop you will find that the, this useless activity is nothing but suffering it is like whiplash of many many desires it is going on every second in the mind and then the attraction and repulsion of the mind is going on the memories are being recalled and the mind is reacting to them and worries and plans and so on imaginations of all kinds this is the egoic activity of the mind the lower mind this is the waking state of an average person 
but when the mind is left to its own activities just like he's saying that just like the uninvited guest they will leave if you don't entertain them if you don't <laughs> attend to them don't offer them tea they will leave similarly just watch just be the awareness instead of being involved in the mental activities so if this is done for a long time this will become a practice this will become your second nature and most of the time the mind will be filled with this bliss of being alive that's all whenever there is absolute need for thinking for desiring for imagining it will appear and you will find that it happens in a split second actually you don't need one full day to think about something one second is enough the mind is very powerful thing it's very very powerful so you cannot see its power because it is being wasted in useless activity it is being covered up by the totally unwanted habitual thinking repetitions after repetition endless repetition every day goes on in the same like track a broken record follows the same thing from morning to night so this is the silent witnessing this is the only practice that we do if you can call it doing it's non doing actually this is the only practice that happens on the path of knowledge there's no other practice all other practices that other paths they prescribe are steps to arrive at silent witnessing there is nothing more to be done it has some effect on the mind that is totally different subject the purification of the mind starts the evolution of the mind speeds up new experiences open up and that is kind of side effect of silent witnessing the human turns to human from an animal and proceeds to superhuman this is you can say it is side effect a minor effect of silent witnessing and that's why he says by watching the flow of mind without interfering or judging as a dispassionate witness the deep unknown will be encouraged to come to the surface of consciousness and release its unused energies to enable you to understand the mystery of the origin of life so it is a mysterious statement but uh, the changes that happen when i be the awareness instead of totally entangled in the mechanical robot like activities of the body mind so we will continue with the book in our next session thank you for listening pure experiences You are listening to Pure Experiences by Tharun Pradhan.